hello. In this video, we are going to examine the so-called Popple style basis sets that are widely used in computational chemistry. If you haven't yet watched the video on Slater type orbitals and Gaussian type orbitals, you might want to check that one out. John Popple was awarded the 1998 Nobel Prize in Chemistry with Walter Cohn for contributions in computational chemistry. As examples of Popple style basis sets, we will look at three different elements. The first element is hydrogen, which we recall has electron configuration of 1s1. Hydrogen is important because in computational chemistry, since it only has one electron, we call it a light atom. And we make a distinction between light atoms, hydrogen, and heavy atoms, which are any atoms that are heavier than hydrogen. Helium would technically be a light atom, but since helium as yet does not make any chemical compounds, the only important light element is hydrogen. The second important element we'll look at is carbon, which we recall has electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Carbon is a prototypical heavy element. And the third element that we will look at is iron. So we have a transition metal, which has a much more extensive electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, and 3d6. Recall that we can distinguish between the core electrons and the valence electrons. The valence electrons are those in the outermost electron shell. Since there is only one electron in hydrogen, the 1s orbital is the valence orbital for hydrogen. For carbon, the valence orbitals are the 2s2 and 2p2, and the 1s2 electrons are the core electrons. For iron, the valence electrons are in the 4s and the 3d orbitals. So 4s2 and 3d6, these are the valence electrons, whereas the 1s 2s, 2p, 3s, and 3p electrons are all core electrons. The first Popple style basis set that we will look at is a so-called minimal basis set. And the typical minimal basis set is STO 3G. The STO, S-T-O, stands for Slater type orbitals. So in this particular basis set, each atomic orbital, either core or valence, is treated as a single Slater type orbital. And we approach that, we kind of make a linear combination to fit each of these Slater type orbitals by a combination of three Gaussians. These three Gaussians that each make up one Slater type orbital are often referred to as Gaussian primitives because each one makes up part of some orbital. So in STO 3G, for example, for hydrogen, we're going to have just one function for the 1s orbital, and that's going to be modeled by a linear combination of three Gaussian primitives. For carbon, we have one Slater type orbital for the 1s orbital, and that's made up of three Gaussians. The 2s orbital is one Slater function made up of three Gaussians. And then we have to be careful here because we recall that in the n equals 2 shell, there are three p orbitals. There's px, 2py, and 2pz. And we have a Slater function for each of 2px, 2py, and 2pz. And each of those 2p orbitals is made up of three Gaussians. When we get to iron, 
we have to have one Slater function for 1s, one Slater function for the 2s. We have three different 2p orbitals, each of which is its own Slater function made up of three Gaussians. Then we have one function for 3s. We have three functions for p because there's 3px, 3py, and 3pz. We have one Slater function for 4s orbital. And then for the 3ds, recall that we have 5d orbitals. Each of those five 3d orbitals is made up of one Slater type orbital. And that particular Slater type orbital is made up of a linear combination of three Gaussians. This is very straightforward in that it closely models our intuitive understanding of orbitals and uh, atomic structure. The problem is, may not be obvious, uh, but in experience, STO 3G calculations did not work well at all. Uh, they did not get answers that were anywhere close to experiment. So this, in general, worked out to be a failure. So that's our so-called minimal basis. It was discovered that to get more uh, close agreement between calculations and experiment, a trick had to be performed. And the trick was the following. We developed basis sets, such as one called 3-21G, or 3-21G. Somewhat a lot of information that is condensed into this nomenclature. The three at the beginning tells us that what's before the dash tells us about what's happening with the core electrons. What happens after the dash tells us about the valence electrons. So when we have core electrons, for example, in carbon, we know that we have this 1s orbital. So 3-21g tells us that in the core, for the 1s orbital, there is one Slater function. You may say, well, there's a three there. Well, we know that there's one Slater function because there is only one number before the dash. So there's only just one number. The three tells us that that one function is made up of three Gaussians, just as in Sto 3G. So, so far, as far as the core is concerned, 3-21G and Sto 3G work the same way. Where it gets more complicated is that after the dash 21, this tells us what happens in the valence orbitals. And we notice that there are two numbers. There's a two and there's a one. And the important thing is that there's two numbers. And that tells us that for every valence orbital, it is broken up into two parts. So for example, in carbon, we know that 2s is a valence orbital. So in the 3-21g basis set, there isn't just one 2s orbital, there are two. One is a little smaller and one is a little bigger. And by having two different 2s orbitals effectively, each one of those is a Slater function. So there's one Slater function for one of the 2s's and there's another Slater function for the second 2s. And we know that because there are two numbers. Now the first orbital, one of the first of the 2s's, is made up of two Gaussians. The second 2s orbital is made up of one Gaussian. So we notice something somewhat peculiar here. First, that the core orbitals are made up of three Gaussians, whereas the valence orbitals are made up of either two or one Gaussian function. And this may seem that this will be less accurate than Sto 3G because we're modeling a Slater function here with just two Gaussians. And here we're modeling a Slater function with just one Gaussian. And we know that one Gaussian and one Slater function don't really look that much alike. But the flexibility that is gained by breaking up each valence orbital, such as the 2s here, into two different functions more than compensates for the fact that we're using fewer Gaussians. Similarly with the 2p orbitals here, we know that we have to have three different 2p's. We have 2px, 2py and 2pz for carbon. In the 321g basis set, 
since we have this split valence, we have two different uh, valence, two different Slater functions for each valence orbital. 2px is going to have two different 2px's. One of the 2px's for carbon is going to have two Gaussians. The second 2px is going to have one Gaussian. So that's how we would treat carbon. The 1s is in the core, so that's a single Slater function of three Gaussians. For iron, the 1s, 2s, the three different 2p's, 2px, 2py, and 2pz, they're all in the core. So again, they're all modeled as a single Slater function with three Gaussians, exactly as in STO 3G. So the handling of the 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, and 3p orbitals of iron is exactly the same if we're using 321G basis set or STO 3G. Where they differ is when we get to the valence part. Because for each of the valence orbitals here, so we have one 4s, and then we have the five different 3ds. So because we have a split valence basis set, it tells us that there's going to be two different 4s's. One of the 4s's is going to be modeled with two Gaussians, and one of them is going to be modeled with one Gaussian. And similarly for the three different, uh, five different 3d orbitals. So those five 3d orbitals will each have two versions. One version, which is a little more contracted, which has made up of two Gaussians, and one that's a little more extensive, a little further away from the nucleus, which is made up of one Gaussian. And it turns out that this split valence idea led to incredible increase in accuracy. For hydrogen, hydrogen has no core electrons. So since it's only valence, it tells us that in the 321G basis set, that the 1S orbital of hydrogen is going to be modeled as, there's going to be two different 1S orbitals, one which is a linear combination of two Gaussians, and one of which is just one Gaussian. This split valence idea works so well that larger basis sets, such as 6-31G, were soon developed. Again, what happens before the hyphen tells about the core orbitals. And since we see just one number, it tells us that each core orbital is modeled as one Slater type orbital. And it's a linear combination of six Gaussians rather than just three. So we can imagine that we can more easily fit the shape of an orbital with six Gaussians than with three Gaussians. It might seem obvious that the more Gaussians we have for a function, the more accurate our results would be. And that's absolutely true. The problem is that when these basis sets were developed, computers were not nearly so fast and powerful as they are today. So you would very quickly run into problems of processor speed and memory size if you had too many Gaussians. So um, it was found that the best trade-off of accuracy and computational efficiency seemed to be when we have the core orbitals modeled as one Slater function with six Gaussians. Then in the valence, again, we have two different types of each valence orbital, and we know that there's two types because we have two numbers. It tells us that the first of each of these is going to be modeled by a linear combination of three Gaussians. And a second one is again with a single Gaussian function. So we see that there's very strong parallels between 321G and 6-31G in that they will have exactly the same number of Slater functions. In the core, the difference is that the Slater functions uh, will be modeled as a linear combination of six Gaussians rather than three and that the first of the split valence orbitals will have three Gaussians instead of two. And again, going from 321G to 631G, we have improved agreement between calculations and experiments, which is what we're looking for. Are there any other improvements we can make to our basis sets to improve them? Yes, there is. One of the first things that was thought of is 
that one of the difficulties with the uh, representations of individual atoms is that, for example, with carbon, the highest angular momentum we have, uh, of orbital angular momentum around the carbon atom, is going to be L equals 1, because L equals 1 corresponds to a p orbital. That isn't so much a problem if we're just trying to model the properties of atomic carbon, but when carbon starts to form bonds, uh, this type of representation isn't necessarily as flexible to arrange the electrons in the optimal location. So a way to get around that is to imagine that instead of just having L equals zero S orbitals and L equals one P orbitals, that carbon actually had atomic orbitals that had an angular momentum L equals two. In other words, it would be as if we just added D orbitals to carbon. And these are called polarization functions. So polarization. And polarization because we have higher angular momentum. And there are two ways that this is commonly represented. So I'll show both of them because they're entirely uh, equal. One way is to put a small d in parentheses after the g. This reminds us that if we're in the uh, second row of the periodic table, so the same row as carbon, that even though the valence, the highest angular momentum valence orbital is a p orbital, we add a d. So now this d just means whatever the highest angular momentum we have for an atom is, add the next highest. So for example, in iron, we actually have d orbitals. We can use 6-31g with this d at the end, but what it means in the case of iron is that instead of adding d orbitals, which we already have, it's going to add f orbitals. So while it says d specifically, it means the next highest angular momentum. So a somewhat more logical uh, nomenclature from that point of view for the same exact basis set is 6-31g and then we put an asterisk or a star. So 6-31g star means exactly the same thing as 6-31g d. It's exactly the same set. It's exactly the same basis set. Another salient feature of this nomenclature, which is not immediately obvious, is that when we put this polarization function in here, this is referring just to the heavy atoms. So when we do it for 631GD, we would add a D to carbon, we would add F to iron, but we would not do anything at all to hydrogen. So uh, if this trick of adding higher angular momentum functions is such a good idea, why don't we do it for hydrogen? And the answer is, we do do it for hydrogen, except we write it a little differently. So if you wanted to add P functions onto hydrogen, how we would write it in our basis set would be this way. So we have 6-31G, and then we first add the D functions to the heavy atoms, and then comma P. And the P after the comma tells us what is going on with the light atom. So the first entry tells us the heavy atoms. So D means add the next highest angular momentum function. And then the P tells us add the next higher angular momentum function to hydrogen. So just as we have two different versions of writing this uh, with a D and with a star, we can also write 6-31GDP equivalently in a very common way, which is to write it as 6 31 g star star so we see one star it tells us that we're adding higher angular momentum functions to the heavy atoms and if we see uh, with the two stars it tells us that we're adding to both the heavy atoms and the light hydrogen atoms if breaking up the valence orbitals into two parts as in the 6-31G or 3-21G basis sets, if breaking up the valence orbitals into two parts was a good idea, then how about if we break them up into three parts? Generally, the 
more is better. And that is exactly what we do in the 6-311G basis set. So the six before the hyphen, since it's just one number, it tells us that each core orbital is modeled as a Slater type function with six Gaussians making it up. And then the numbers after the dash tell us, we see that there's three different numbers. There's a three, there's a one, and a one. So that tells us that each valence orbital will be broken up into three parts. There'll be like three versions of each one. The first will have be made up of three Gaussians. The second Slater function will be made up of just one Gaussian. And the third version of the valence orbital will have just one Gaussian. And by breaking up the valence orbitals into three parts, we get even greater agreement with experiment. So we see that if we add most of these uh, techniques together, we can get larger and larger basis sets with more and more functions. The greater the number of functions in general, the more accurate our results will be. And as computers have gotten faster and memory has gotten less expensive, it has gotten more and more efficient to use larger and larger basis sets. So for example, it's typical to use uh, things like 6-311G, so that tells us we have split valence, and then we can actually add polarization functions on heavy atoms with a D and polarization functions on hydrogen with a P. So we, again, using the other nomenclature, we can write the same thing as 6-311G and then star, star. And there is one last commonly used technique to expand our basis set and to make it more efficient. And that is the idea of diffuse functions. So a typical basis set with diffuse functions is written as 6-31 plus G. And we'll show what this means. We notice right away that the number before the hyphen is a six, it's just one number. So that tells us that the core orbitals are modeled as one Slater function, which is just one number, and that each of those functions is made up of six Gaussians. That's what the six means. Now, after the dash, we have two numbers. We have three and one. Since there's two different numbers after the dash, that tells us we have a split valence set. Each of the valence orbitals is broken up into two functions. The first function is made up of three Gaussians. The second function is made up of one Gaussian. So what's the plus? Well, the plus are these diffuse functions. And diffuse functions are simply supersized versions of S and P orbitals. Where they are particularly useful is in cases where we have anions or certain um, uh, compounds where the electron configuration is more spread out than we might normally expect. So the advantage of gain by adding diffuse functions isn't usually as substantial as we get from split valence or adding um, polarization functions. But just as we did with those things, we notice when we have a plus sign here, just one plus sign, this is the case for the heavy atoms. So it tells us that we're putting these diffuse functions on the heavy atoms, but not hydrogen. So it's kind of similar the way that we use the nomenclature for the star, one star, or two stars. One plus, one star is just the heavy atoms. Two stars is heavy atoms and light atoms. So we might imagine that if we have one plus sign, that's a diffuse function on the heavy atom. But if we want to also add diffuse functions on hydrogen, we want to put down something like this. 6-31 plus plus G. So the plus plus tells us, the first plus tells us that we have diffuse functions on heavy atoms. And the second plus tells us that we also have those diffuse functions on hydrogen. So with that in mind, can we combine all these different types of orbitals uh, into very, very large basis sets. We absolutely can. So we can end up with things, and we commonly use sets like 6-311, 6-311, 6-311, 6-311, 6-311, 6-311, 6-311, 6-311, 6-311, 6-311, 6-311, 6-311, 6-311, 6-311, 6-311, 6-311, 6-311, 6-311, 6
So we see that we have a split valence basis set, 6-31. We can add diffuse functions on heavy atoms and then on light atoms. We have the G. And then we can add polarization functions, higher angular momentum on the heavy atoms with the first star, and then on the hydrogen atoms as well with the second star. So this is a typical uh, large uh, Popple style basis set. Um, and just to show, this is not by any stretch the largest possible basis sets that we can use, but this is a nice example of a relatively large basis set that shows uh, most of the details of the nomenclature that we commonly use for these Popple style basis sets. Thank you very much for your attention. Have a good one.